will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. Servant of the Most High, unabashed and unafraid. I am Christopher Manti, and this is Frontline. Welcome back, my friends, to Frontline. I'm Christopher Manti, your humble host. Welcome. We are in, of course, the Shemitah year of 2015. Now in March the 16th. Beware the Ides of March. It's not today, is it? I don't think so. Anyway, welcome. Thank you for joining me. As always, a sincere pleasure to have you along for the broadcast here, whether it is live 10 a.m. Eastern Time on the East Coast of the United States, or whenever on demand, if you're watching me afterwards at your convenience, thank you for that as well. I'm sure the vast uh, majority of you are viewing me like that. So I thank you for participating, and we thank our Father in Heaven. That's what this is all about. This is about the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and uh, my attempt in this format to spread that gospel to the nations and um, so I thank you for joining with me in that and I hope the Lord speaks to you today your heart and mind maybe even your body to heal it and uh, we ask father for you to do these things to fulfill your word thank you for your word thank you for your plan and for being long-suffering and patient with us but you're not willing that any should die or go to hell but that you'd save us. So, pray that your kingdom be increased this day, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Holy Spirit be with us. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, as I say often, there's never a dull moment in these days. We are um, very rapidly accelerating times. No matter where you look, there is something else going on. And a lot of it has significance. Um, some of it does not. Some of it does not. And that's what we have to have discernment about, right? We have to know what is truly biblical or uh, is talked about in the Bible and what is not. You know, there's um, a lot of folks will go on and on and on about the New World Order this and Illuminati that will Illuminati is not in the Bible so be careful there's a false narrative out there right Satan is a master deceiver the greatest of all deceivers as his followers call him um, so with with that in mind uh, realize that he will throw you off the scent, even if you're very close, uh, to look over here, right? Don't worry about this Middle Eastern stuff. Look at, 
look at all this this big bankers in America or Europe or Japan or whatever um, you know it goes off in all kinds of different directions just keep it in the Word of God make sure you have scriptural backup and don't fly off the handle all right yes there's there are prophecies about various things and about things that will happen and must happen um, but there's a great deal of misunderstanding uh, both of course outside the church there's nothing but confusion and um, idol worship but even within the church there have been so many false doctrines taught as truth from the biggest denomination down to the the whim of uh, crazy people who want to strike out on their own and think they have all the answers um, you know it's no limit to deception and that's the that's the mo of our enemy is to deceive you and however that happens whether it's through fear whether it's through oh, smooth words stroking your ego um, making you feel like one of the elites it's, it goes on and on <clears throat> whatever you can imagine he's the enemy is at work trying to deceive you so keep that in mind all right and but thankfully we have the Holy Spirit on our side and uh, we have friends in high places so to speak we have a great cloud of witnesses and so that we will not be left uh, hopeless or without the truth there will always be a remnant who carries that and that's just b biblical that's the way it's always been so you're seeing this in a lot of teachings and a lot of folks are beginning to realize that what they've taught been taught is wrong and that's one of the things I want to discuss today I wrote a piece last year called the heresy of imminence which is the uh, there's a couple different flavors of it but it's very um, widespread in the church church generally in the different denominations um, where either through the premillennial model or the amillennial model there is a false teaching that the appearance of Jesus returning is imminent or can be at any time or any day and that is false there's nothing else that needs to happen before Jesus returns at either to rapture you or to set up his kingdom and do final judgment and all that stuff those are false 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 teachings anyway I'll just go through it in a minute and tell you why and why it's, it's important that you shed that and realize that it's a trick and not of God and because um, it matters you know like it's right why would he tell you if it didn't matter Jesus said that paraphrase paraphrasing him there so if it was important enough to mention it's important enough for you to learn and know the right order and sequence and this is nothing new right this is the way it's always been men will deceive themselves and be deceived keep keep operating in that way um, look at the Pharisees at the first advent they were no more studied accredited scholars of the Bible or of the scriptures what you'd call the old, the Tanakh of the Old Testament now um, they had it all they either willingly or ignorantly missed it they shouldn't it was all there we all knew they all knew all the relevant scriptures Zechariah and Daniel and Isaiah and Hosea and uh, even Mo the words of Moses and Deuteronomy etc etc et they all pointed to um, the first Messiah coming twice and the first time was not as a conquering warrior but as a suffering servant and savior to the whosoever will follow him so they missed it 
what makes you think today is any different? Just because someone is saved or Christian, it means they automatically know what's going to happen? No, they do not. Just because someone was a Jew who, who believed and did everything uh, that they thought they should, were they saved? Or did they have the truth? Or did they miss it and insert their own uh, substitute teaching? So the point is, the uh, phenomenon is not new. It's it's inherent to our fallen state, to the world that we live in, and to the Lord of this world, who is Satan, the deceiver. Our enemy uh, is very, very busy. Um, so it's nothing new, but we do have to cut through it with a little Holy Spirit sword, right? Cut it down to size and really get... It might even hurt you a little, your pride, your uh, your understanding. Maybe you don't get it, but meat is hard to chew, right? Milk is easy to digest, and meat is not. Now, I have digestive issues, right? <laughs> I think we all have some. Um, but once you get it, you can't lose it. Yeah, I mean, you'll 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 always see, whoa, uh, it's right there. Or converse, it's not there at all. How could I have believed that? So we'll go into that, the heresy of imminence, and also on the agenda, um, we want to talk about, obviously, we want to drill home the Islamic beast and why the caliphate uh, that is emerging and that exists right now in the Middle East is the beast, and um, or it is, is uh, maturing into the final form that the book of Revelation talks about, and we're going to t show you those attributes, why... Oh, that is true. Why it is what we should be looking for. Um, new teachings by my uh, fellow traveler, uh, my friend, uh, I think. I call him a friend, Joel Richardson. A great teacher and author, and uh, he's just making all the, the rounds in media, Christian media. He's everywhere. He was just on the um, um, Jim Baker program for geez looks like about two hours worth of material in there and uh, and he has he, he just he threw together a new teaching for when he was in Iraq recently near the Iranian border and did a teaching on Daniel 8 lots of good stuff so I'll talk about what he what he discussed and you know frankly what are you doing to resist the beast because knowing about the uh, the plans of the enemy and the kingdom that he's building is one thing, but what are you doing about it? God didn't tell you so you could sit back in your house and board up the windows, spiritually speaking and or physically. Um, he told you so you could take action on it. All right? He who loves me does what I say. Another Yeshua paraphrase there. Keep my commandments. Do what I tell you. So, um, what are you doing? Uh, you know, I mean, I have an easy step. One thing you can do is show the world uh, what you believe. Is uh, you're willing to stand against the B system and his uh, Islamic. Uh, intimidation and you wear a t-shirt out and about go right to your you know drive past your local mosque and I don't know whatever you, you're led to do do it the right way do it the Lord's way not your way um, you know witness and try to save some from the fire that's our job anyway wearing something is a, an easy way to do that or it's one step in doing that towards your destination so we'll, I encourage that. And um, of course, if you want to contact me, sorry, I'm, I always forget to throw that out there. Manti4 is my Twitter handle. Uh, follow me there and send me a private message whenever you want. That's fine. Uh, ChristopherManti.com is my uh, hub of all my activities. You can link to everything there. My ministry page, my, um, my blog, videos that I do, etc. Speaking of videos, um, there's been one that I've had in the Lord gave to me um, months ago as far as uh, 
script to present. And so it's been done in that form, but uh, the video production side of it was not my forte and still isn't. But So I enlisted uh, the help of a friend to create it, uh, but that didn't really come about because they got kind of confused about what the tenor and what I wanted. So I was like, you know what? I guess God's telling me to do it myself. So this is a teaser of that. There is a longer version that's uh, over six minutes long that um, I was counseled uh, to cut it down because no one's going to pay attention that long, which some people will, I know. Uh, but this, I think, is wise to um, put out a what you, in the industry you call a teaser, just um, trying to entice, you know, to, to learn more. The longer video has a lot of teaching in it and just in-your-face kind of stuff, which is what I wanted to get across. And I don't know when I'm going to be able to release that. Again, it's done. It's just I'm waiting for the Lord to say so. And um, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but this is the... Uh, trailer for that and please anything that I show here is freely available on my YouTube channel or YouTube somewhere it's not uh, private or anything like that so share 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 talk to your family and friends about this and um, this is called prepare 2015 wings of the eagle friends wings of the eagle prepare 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 the way of the Lord prepare to resist the beast so use that hashtag on your all your social media if you're on board here with this message use it it's nobody owns it use it this is how we will begin to unite Regardless of your background or um, denomination, all you do is be a follower of Yeshua. If you're a Christian, use it. And um, we'll resist together. All right? Twitter and Facebook and all your social, they all use these hashtag things. It's a way to get on the same page, right? Okay, so you saw in that video... Um, about just again teasing the the message that God wants us to prepare it's not it's not an automatic download right when the bad stuff starts I'll either be out of here or I'll know what to do ah, I'm not worried about it you, you better think about that son um, prepare to meet your God O Israel I don't know, that's an active word. Right? And when the Lord in Malachi 3, which I reference all the time about 
getting together with those who fear him, fear his name, once you speak to each other, the Lord will literally write your name in a book in heaven. So he will remember you on the day of the Lord. Pretty awesome. So why don't you do that? That is the purpose of Wings of the Eagle. The main one is to facilitate a network, a meeting place. Uh, find out where other people are in your nation, in your state, and reach out to them. You know, I'm not going to make the connections uh, or, or, you know, lead you by the hand. I'm just providing the, the venue. Put your name on there. Submit your information. Even if it's just to um, put your email and get updates, so be it. But I really would prefer that you put your information out. Tell us where you are. Tell us. Tell your brothers and sisters in Christ who are ready to fight uh, where you are how to contact you simple that's what the site is there for mostly um, the network has uh, I lost count now uh, one of 13 nations something like that and um, most states in the United States are represented most um, provinces in Canada so get on the ball okay I don't know what you're waiting for maybe you're waiting for the uh, the, the treaty with Israel to be signed before you get serious I don't hey that's not that's not me I don't think that's what God wants either I think um, if you're gonna be useful you have to know what you're gonna at least have the, the idea of what's what you're gonna do or what what's coming you teach others even if it's just to uh, get other ministries together and teach together and organize together Great. That's where <clears throat> that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm finding other ministries around that are hearing the same things from the Lord, and it's really something to, a sight to see. It's uh, really great to behold. Um, so you saw in the video there again the, the four horsemen, and that, of course that's Revelation six and Zechariah six also. Um, and I think there's a deeper meaning. Everyone, all prophecy students, know what the four horsemen are, or what that they are, and the four colors, and they have different aspects to them, and so forth. Um, the real key to it all, I think, is tying them to the four beasts of Daniel 7, in that it's a progressive building of the empire. It's not just for um, vague spirits. There's specific spirits that go out to form the beast. It's not. Um, so I know some people teach the you know the white horse is Catholicism a thousand years ago. It's ridiculous. Um, I think there are four stages of the beast. And the white horse, I think, is riding as we speak. The horseman is conquering and conquered the lands of ancient Babylon, which are Iraq and Syria. It's, there are no Iraq and Syria anymore. No matter what your president or whoever may tell you, there are no two nations called Iraq and Syria anymore. The, the border has literally been erased. There's a, there's a khalifa, there's a caliphate there. A new nation called the Islamic State, and um, on you know the far reaches of those nations are governments that are fighting to survive. The the Assad government in western uh, Syria and the uh, who the heck is in the president of Iraq now? I don't know. It's a, it's an Iranian, um, Iranian backed uh, Shiite. The Shiites are all on the east side of. Iraq. So those forces are pushing, uh, you know, stressing out the Islamic State. But in the middle, it's all them, and uh, so that's they, that's the White Rider. And people like to say, well, this is a peaceful um, thing. You know, I don't see that. 
and some people say it's the Antichrist himself. I used to believe that also. And I'm not saying it's not because it does produce him eventually, but we're not there yet. So um, it's a spirit, and so the pay attention. And in Zechariah, it tells you where these spirits come from, and it tells you point blank that it's all about Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. I mean, it's right there. And that's the Iraq, Syria, and Turkey are what the ancient uh, empire of Assyria was made of. And again, not a coincidence that the Antichrist is called the Assyrian in several places, Book of Isaiah especially. Um, so that's where you should be watching. And not just, don't chase the Antichrist, uh, the, the individual, all right, the false Christ, whatever. Who is it going to be? Just follow the kingdom, right? And we see that because we're told the order of things. And the kingdom is established, then it goes through growing pains. And you're about to see a big pain when the Persians invade. Um, but again, there's four stages to it. And we're at the Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, okay, whatever you choose to call it, that's stage one. Stage two is when the Persians take over. That's the Iranians. Stage three is when the Turks take over. That's what the Bible calls Yavan, or it's translated Greece. But Yavan, again, is a reference to Noah's grandson in the book of Genesis, and he settled on the islands of Asia Minor on the west coast of what Turkey is today. So that's where, and that's where Constantinople or Istanbul is that's the capital of turkey that's where pergamos is and pergamos has the seed of satan in it okay you get the picture so uh, anyway so the turks come and then they take over and then they divide the whole region into four parts and then the little horn the antichrist emerges he brings together 10 leaders called the 10 kings signs a deal with israel over the temple mount in Jerusalem everyone's happy deal signed temple gets built now we're rocking all right so that's what we're looking for generally and um, that's the reason why we have to prepare and no, find others who know or are willing to learn or have a little inkling right because the Lord uses a here a little there a little principle right he never gives everything to one person or one ministry he just doesn't um, certainly hasn't to me but there are things that I can contribute and you can contribute and Joel Richardson is contributing and Armageddon News is contributing and uh, Nelson Walters uh, from the gospel in the end times com is contributing um, uh, there are other bloggers and things that if you watch my Twitter feed you can follow them also it's coming together and it's pretty awesome to see so Pay attention, all right? Prepare, and, a, and again, prepare for a new, a longer video which talks about um, exactly what we will be expecting. And, of course, if you listen here, you'll get a lot of that as well. So, the main thing I wanted to get to right now, because I didn't touch on it last week, was the heresy of imminence. This is Frontline, by the way. I'm Christopher Manti, your host, as always. Uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, here if you're in the broadcast now just type in a message at the bottom of the screen there under my ugly mug and I'll answer you there if I see it or you can email me uh, either through CMV TV which there's a link right on again under the broadcast um, or you can go to my YouTube page Manti 7000 and communicate with, with me that way and watch the videos whatever all right heresy of eminence pardon me Okay, this is going to be tough for some people to hear. I hope um, it's not too tough, but that's all right. Imminence means at any moment. It's imminent. It could happen right now or today or tomorrow. 
or an hour from now. I say it's heresy to think that way because the Bible not only doesn't say that about Jesus returning, it says the opposite of that. All right? The opposite. So that would make it a heresy. So basically, the byline is, no, my fellow Christian, no. Jesus cannot return today. He cannot. He cannot return at any moment. At any moment. Not possible. The apostles, remember them? They're pretty important sources. And the early church would give that a hearty amen. Thank you, Mr. Manti. You are correct, sir. He cannot return at any moment. Nope. They'd say, yep, you're right. Well, isn't their opinion worth something? They were there. They talked to the Lord himself, both before and after the crucifixion. Paul met the guy. He would know. John was his disciple from the beginning. He would know. Peter, pretty close to the Lord. He would know. All right. But, even though they would agree, what has happened is, like I said before, just as in the times of the Old Covenant, the expectations and wisdom of men have since chiseled away at that sound doctrine to the point of mocking those who still hold to it. That's right. What? You don't believe he can return today? Ha! <laughs> well, you don't know what you're talking about. Why does it matter if the heresy was institutionally accepted hundreds of years ago? It's still heresy. Is it any less heretical? As Jesus, the prophets of old, and those who formed the church taught the exact opposite. There's not one place in the Bible that says he can return at any moment. Not one. There are two variations of the eminence lie that dominate the church today. One is amillennialism. The other is pre-tribulationism. Those are big words, I know. Amillennial or amillennialism, I'll get into exactly what these big words mean, but those are the two strains of it. Fortunately, or not, I have personally learned under both of those teachings. I believed those things at one time in my life. I was raised in the Catholic amillennial setting from, from infancy through college. Okay, so it's my entire childhood and formative years was an amillennial or amillennial teaching. What I realized, in other words, there's no literal thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth. When I realized that, that was false, and it clearly was, because like I've, I think I've related to this audience, I've known since the third grade that the second coming was something that the Lord wanted me to know about deeply and to get ready for it. Um, if it's imminent, you can't get ready for it. It can happen any time. You can't do anything. Um, anyway, so I realized that was false, and I did in my college years, or uh, basically before that even, when I was in high school, 15 or so years old. Um, but I realized it was false. So then I went the total opposite extreme, and I fell into the overzealous camp of flying away before the tribulation. Uh, through my mid-twenties. So, you know, I spent a good couple of years in that deception. Thankfully, more and more are having the experience that I did and are seeing the truth. That are coming out of that false teaching. Now, as you look to history, the first advent, okay, when Jesus came to Bethlehem and did his thing. What was the majority teaching of the religious leadership at that time? Did they interpret scripture correctly? Did they? Sadducees and Pharisees? Weren't they supposed to be priests to Yahovah, to the Lord, to the Father? Weren't they supposed to be priests 
to him who did everything he said and had divine understanding? Wasn't that the point of the scriptures of the law and the prophets? So they would know. That was the point. For if they had believed the original eyewitnesses like Moses, they would have recognized Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. And that he would have to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, killed per Psalms 22 and Daniel 9, etc., etc. But no, in their great wisdom and traditions, they were certainly correct, even when they plainly opposed the law and the prophets, the word of God. Jesus pointed that out to them for time after time after time. That they didn't get the word of God. It's right there and they missed it. These are the ones who were supposed to know. The very ones who should have known it all knew nothing. Now, as we look to the second coming, let us remember the words of the truly wise Solomon. When he says, that which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Just like in the first coming, our religious leaders will get it wrong. That's the message. Here's the two ways that it's wrong. Amillennialism. This is heresy by allegory. First, it seems that any claim that the church of the 5th century, that people want to say, oh yes, this was decided a long time ago. The church of the 5th century dismissing premillennialism, in other words, that Jesus reigns for a thousand years on the earth and comes to establish that thousand year reign from Jerusalem. It's dubious at best, this evidence that the, the early, or when I say early, I mean 500 years after Jesus, um, that they taught that, that imminence was correct. There is no, no primary source from either the first council of Constantinople, which happened around that time, or the council of Ephesus in AD 400 that established this. Nothing. There is a vague dismissal of it by the Catholics in the 1940s in the Catechism, of course, which is not the Word of God, it's a tradition, that said, quote, premillennialism cannot be safely taught, whatever that means. Uh, in other words, so to me, they're saying the, the Pope at the time and the, the, uh, the church leadership of the Catholics were saying, we don't really, we're not going to say it's wrong, but we don't know enough to teach it. So they don't get it. They're admitting they don't get it. But has never risen to the level of heresy from their side. No one's ever declared premillennialism to be heretical because, obviously, it's not. The Orthodox, right, like the Eastern Orthodox, and the Lutheran branches of the church also, officially, are amillennial. So it seems there's a great deal of trust among the largest denominations in this deviation from the apostles' teachings. That's a shame, isn't it? That's terrible. Let there be no doubt, in the words of Barack Obama. If one allegorizes the millennial kingdom you are by necessity advocating for an imminent return of Christ. I hope you know that. If you say the millennium is not real, or it's not literal, there is no other position. You have to say, well, he could come back at any time then, because all the stuff before the millennium is an all an allegory, or has already happened. So once you allegorize the millennium, you're allegorizing many other prophecies detailing what happens before the millennium begins, including 
nearly all of them spoken by Jesus himself in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, etc., etc. You do realize that. You're allegorizing the plain words of your Savior when you say it's not literal. And if you teach, for example, the abomination of desolation, if you teach that happened in history with Antiochus, you have slid right into preterism. But that's a whole nother heresy. And at least that's one that is admitted by the vast majority of Christians. Is That's heretical. Preterism is heretical. But that's beside the point today. Do this. A little uh, logic experiment with me now. Take one of the mainstream churches who tell you the millennium is now. In other words, we're living in it because it's not literal. So the age of the church. Um, and that we only await Christ's return. And the final judgment. Any one of those churches. Have you ever heard a teaching from them on Satan's impending release? In the final battle of Gog Magog in Revelation 20? To say nothing of the supporting Old Testament scriptures on those topics? Of course you haven't! You'll never hear that from them. The re have no way! The reason is obvious. The myriad questioning of things like, if I were to hear that lesson in church, I would say, where where was Satan bound for the past 2,000 years? Exactly. Because that's the eschatology that they're presenting. If the, if the millennium is now, if it's not a literal thousand years, but it's two thousand years or longer, the millennium teaches that Satan is bound in the pit and can't influence the nations. Has that happened? I don't see that. Uh, not true. Okay? That's the reason why they won't teach that, because they'll get questions like that. I thought another one would be like, I thought Jesus could come any time, then how is Satan here to gather his army first? Because again, if you say we're at Revelation 20 now, and the millennium is, is it, right now, how does Satan get out and gather his army to fight the returning Jesus? Because that's what it says. Or not the returning Jesus, and the Bible doesn't say anything about him returning, it just says there's a final battle against Jerusalem and Jesus is there. Fine, if you want to take that view that that's the return, how did he get out? And where are his armies? Those questions would be impossible to address because there's no answer. They won't bother answering those questions because they know they cannot without exposing themselves as ignorant or worse. Instead, you'll get the milk toast version like, no man knows a day or hour, which is tantamount to the satanic scripture twisting admonition, judge not, right? Oh, judge not, Bam. the end, <laughs> right? Oh, we don't know the day of the hour, the end. I don't think so. By itself, it means nothing at all. You can't just say you don't know the day of the hour, therefore you can't know anything. In other words, what they're really saying is, we have no idea what the Bible teaches about the second coming, and you won't either. Or, we're told it's good enough that our denomination has believed this way for hundreds of years. So who are you to say otherwise, peon? Conveniently forgotten by these churches are the early church fathers, the ones who were created the thing, like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Hermas, Hippolytus, and Cyprian. These are the giant founders of the faith. Jesus is the foundation, you know what I mean? These are the guys of the early church who all, all those names, all, all, taught a future literal millennium. Why? They learned it directly from the apostles. Face to face, these guys learned from them and their writings. 
it was clear in the text of the New Testament that all the apostles taught a literal thousand year millennium. The Gospels say it, the epistles say it of Paul and, and others, Revelation, all of it. It all agrees. There is no spiritual kingdom that Jesus is not here for, called the millennium. Now, despite what they may tell you, believing in a literal millennium of Jesus ruling from Jerusalem is not dependent on Revelation 20. Some will come out and say, well, if it wasn't for Revelation 20, this wouldn't even be an issue. Bogus. Strike that entire book from the Bible. Not just that chapter. The entire book of Revelation. Take it out. Which, by the way, some of them want to do. And there are still a dozen different proofs of the same thousand year kingdom in other scriptures now to paraphrase an old friend of mine they think you are stupid for example in a verse which is often applied as a zinger to people like me second peter 3 8 which, by the way, is a quote of Psalms 90, verse 4. Most people don't know. Second Peter 3, 8 says, And the day with the Lord is as a thousand years, they'll say. That means it's not literal. Oh, that scripture is actually a witness against them. Why? Check it out. Read the whole thing. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. But the day of the Lord, what's that? One day. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, again, one day, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Well, that's an unmistakable day, is it not? Is any of that happening now? Obviously no. The day of the Lord, which you just read, is a thousand years long. Peter just said it. The day of the Lord is a thousand years long. In other words, the millennium. None of that burning destruction can be allegorized away, even under the most liberal method. So that is your proof that amillennialism, amillennialism of the Catholic Church of the Orthodox Church, of the Lutheran Church. Now, I'm not trying to disrespect them, but their eschatology is false. Not anything else, I'm talking just their eschatology, their teaching on the Second Coming, is wrong. It's not allegorical. Right? It's pretty simple. Now, Frankly, a lot of people listening to me, I'm sure very few of them are amillennialists. But I, I encourage you to share that, those truths with your family or friends who might be. Now, what a lot of folks may be who are listening to me now, or I'm, I know you know them, are called pre-tribulationists. Pre-tribulationism is heresy by a different way by lazy exegesis what does that mean I'll tell you what I again I was a pre-tribulationist right I believe this once I came out of the Catholic Church I, I a whole new world was opening to me that the Lord is coming physically to establish a thousand year reign in Jerusalem it's all true this is awesome let me devour all the books I could all right I was so excited I was so zealous, so on fire for God, and I was, that I took man's word for it all. Isn't that the way? The smart guys 
already did all the legwork. Of course, they had it all figured out, I said. The painful irony is we get so zealous that we don't slow down to examine our belief. Actually, be Bereans. We all say, oh, I'm a Berean. I check everything out on the Word of God. Then be a Berean and prove what you're being told. Scripture interprets itself. And not just get a rapture high and think you are some special super class of super church that gets to escape tribulation that everyone else gets. Including, by the way, the church throughout history. Including, by the way, your 11 of the 12 apostles martyred. Church throughout history martyred by themselves sometimes, by the Muslims. Today, what is happening to your brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq and Egypt and Nigeria and Iran? They're being killed for the witness of Jesus. Where is their rapture? The entire church throughout the past 2,000 years has had to endure tribulation, and so will we. Those lands that I just mentioned, Iraq and Syria, uh, Egypt, Turkey, they were the crown jewels of Christendom. This is where the church was first blossomed. This was the headquarters of the planet Earth for Christianity, was Syria and Turkey, and Iraq, and Jordan. Where are they now? Now they have hell on earth. That should at least give you pause. If you believe once, as I did, that the church won't have to endure things, like being beheaded for Christ. You hear it day after day after day after day from the pre-trib believers. Sometimes you'll hear them called dispensationalists. You hear them say it all the time. Christ could come today. Be ready. I want to fly away with Jesus at any moment. His return is imminent. Except for a fact that even a cursory reading of the Bible says otherwise. It is not hidden. It is not a secret, the rapture. Revelation has already been delivered. There is not some secret coming that no one will see and is preceded by zero events. Behold, listen to God, the words that my second grader can understand. This is Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we request you, brethren, Christian, that with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's the coming of the Lord, a gathering together to him, that's the rapture. It's called the gathering. It's not called the rapture. It's called the gathering, okay? This is the topic, the rapture, the return of God, of Jesus Christ, and the rapture. Okay. With regard to that, that you not be shaken, quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed by either a spirit or a message or a letter as if it was from us. Who is us? The, the church who knows Paul, the one who saw Jesus, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Whoa! Hang on. This knocks out amillennialism right there in one, one half a sentence. And the pre-tribulation rapture. The Lord has not come and will not come any day. 
Why? Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. What's that? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering, the rapture, will not come until and unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness or the man of sin the antichrist is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship so he takes his seat in the temple of god displaying himself as being god don't you remember that while i was with you still i was telling you these things paul is repeating himself because they're so dense Do you think, do you see right there, did Paul just tell you the rapture was any moment? Or did he say it's at least third on the list? So not only is the second coming of Jesus equated with our gathering to him, it's the same event. The rapture and the coming of Jesus, the second coming. Second coming of Jesus equated with our gathering and the day of the Lord. So it's all the same thing. But Paul gives two explicit events that must happen first before the rapture. It says it's so plain. He said it's so plain that he says, don't you remember I told you this already? What is he saying there? Go read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. He already said this to the Thessalonians. But they were dense. Don't be dense. Don't be fooled by a spirit or a letter from someone else as if it were Paul or the apostles. That's exactly what Paul just said. The only way you're going to uh, think the rapture is imminent is if you're listening to another spirit or a message from someone who claims to be like Paul or the apostles. They're liars. The spirit is a liar. Those who tell you otherwise is it are liars. It's not imminent. It can't come today. It isn't in the past, and it isn't today either, because these certain things have to happen first. The admonition that Paul gives is the same one that Jesus gave time and time again when it comes to the days of his return. Don't be deceived by false prophets. What would a false prophet say? Well, just like in Jeremiah's time, go read Jeremiah. That's all about false prophets. Just like in Jeremiah's time, the false prophets were telling people, don't, don't worry, you'll be fine. The king of Babylon is not coming. Jeremiah says he is coming. We say, no, he is not coming. We know what God says. We, the religious leaders, we know the word of God. This Jeremiah is, is not telling you the truth. He's not coming. Don't worry about King of Babylon. Do the do you see the words will not come? Go back to Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let no man in any way deceive you, for it will not come. So did he say will not come? Unequivocally, will not. Will not. Rapture will not come before these things will not or did he say may not come or i'm wrong it could happen before paul just showed you again that it's at best third event on the list and frankly it's a lot farther down than that but you will not don't even think about a rapture don't even think about it until you see what the great falling away from the faith, and the Antichrist sitting in the temple in Jerusalem. It's impossible. If you don't see the Antichrist sitting in the temple and Christians falling away from Jesus in droves because of it, the rapture cannot happen. The at-any-moment doctrine of eminency doesn't just miss the mark, it contradicts what the Bible says will happen. 180 degrees in reverse. Just like the false prophets of Jeremiah. 
God says, King of Babylon's coming. False prophets say, no, he's not. It's complete opposite. Bible says, rapture cannot happen at any moment. False believers say, yes, it does. False prophets. I'm sorry if this offends you, but I don't know how else to say it. I don't know how else to repeat it, to teach it, because God, uh, Jesus, and Paul, and everyone else, and Peter, are completely agreed. They're harsh with this. Don't even consider it. Don't be an idiot. Thinking the rapture is going to come save you from anything. You don't even see the Antichrist here. He's not sitting in the temple. There's not even a temple. Are you, are you nuts? It's backwards, okay? So, bottom line is this. Not only is this a false doctrine, it's heretical. Because it's not just wrong, it's the opposite. It's the anti-teaching. Anti-truth, <laughs> right? It's not just happens to be wrong. It's the exact opposite in your face finger in the eye you're wrong it says god says can't happen before things like antichrist in jerusalem and great apostasy imminent says it can happen today so which side do you want how about jesus let's listen to him do we give jesus the authority as a christian or don't we is he the final say is he the spirit of prophecy, the testimony that he gives of all prophecy? Well, let's listen to our Lord. If he really is your Lord, then listen to him. The apostles, the disciples came to him and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, See to it that no one misleads you for they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name did he say the sign of his coming is the rapture uh, I miss that. So maybe we get a rapture after we are killed and hated by all nations because of his name. At that time, when you see this tribulation and kill you and hate it, at that time many will fall away. Hmm. Paul just said that. Many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. How could you fall away if you're not a Christian now? You can't. This is talking about Christians. Jesus is talking to Christians. The church will leave him. Many in the church will fall away and betray one another. Have you thought about that lately? At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and will hate one another. Therefore, I don't see any rapture here yet, right? Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, that's just what Paul said. For when you see that, then will be great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now nor ever will unless those days have been cut short no life would be saved but for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short behold i have told you in advance for just listen you want to see the coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering together with him? For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, 
so will the coming of the Son of Man be. How does lightning look, folks? Not invisible. Oh, the opposite, actually. Even to the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, what tribulation? The great tribulation. After the great tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. That's, of course, he's quoting several Old Testament prophecies about the day of the Lord. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then, after all of that, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, for they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And then he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. The words of Jesus Christ says the rapture is at the end of the tribulation. The end. The coming of the Lord Jesus. The day of the Lord. The rapture is all the same time. There is no equivocation in the words of Jesus or Paul or anyone else on the topic. What did Paul say regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him? That's the rapture. Jesus said, after the tribulation, he will send forth his angels and they will gather together. That's it. Simple. So. Now we're left with the words of Jesus himself. And I said, what's that now, Jesus? Uh, you say there's a great falling away and the Antichrist in Jerusalem, then the rapture after the great tribulation? Just like Paul said. No, you, that can't be right. It has to be any moment because my denomination says so. Because I say so. Jesus cannot return at any moment. It's heresy to think so. We'll be back. All I see is shattered pieces. I can't keep Hidden like a secret Yes, my friends, resistthebeast.net or .org. Take your pick. You saw how serious this is now, right? Well, you know, we're not going to get off the earth and avoid this. I just showed you that in the word of God. There's no rapture to rescue you. You're going to have to put up with persecution, 
possible martyrdom and hatred of your fellow man, including fellow Christians, just like the church has always done. You're not special. So you're going to hang on to your old beliefs? Or maybe you know the truth, but you won't tell your your church or your friends and family and co-workers. You think you're just going to hang out in the, you know, stay anonymous in the sideline out here and you're just put a blindfold on till it's all over. Not going not gonna to work, friend. Resistthebeast.net. Please go there now. Now. You don't want to get something for yourself? Get it for a friend. Fine. Get it for your pastor. How about that for an inroad? Shirt. T-shirt. Sweatshirt. Uh, mugs. Hats. Bumper stickers. Stickers. Um, that you stick on stuff around town, but yay big. Uh, your gas station, your grocery store. We have one for specifically for halal food. You know, the, the Islamic uh, Sharia about uh, food it has to be slaughtered in a certain way, etc., etc. All it does is fun jihad. Your murder of your fellow Christians by buying halal food. So don't buy it. And we have a sticker that says so. It says halal funds jihad. Stick it in your local store. I mean, where where are the warriors here? Where are the spiritual warriors? Where are those without fear, like the Lord said? Now, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not uh, a hypocrite. I have a bumper sticker on my car. I have a T-shirt. I wear it out in public. I paid for it myself. I don't get a break. We've got a lot of interest in this, but many people are not taking advantage. I don't know. I've never um, – people have asked for different designs, which is awesome. As a matter of fact, one person last – what is it? A week or two ago uh, sent a message in. That, hey, why don't you have a, a shirt that says you know, something about uh, you know, the, the true God is actually the one God and Jesus is his son, which is uh, kind of the opposite of the – Shahada in, in Islam about denying the Son of God and, and the false God Allah. So anyway, um, we're like, oh, hey, that's a really good idea. Let's make that. So we made it. Now you can buy it. Um, and I think actually I just got a comment uh, this week come in a couple days ago about uh, women's uh, on one of the designs. There was no women's cut on that. That is uh, just an oversight. Um, I apologize. I'll get it done. Or we'll get it done. Okay? Definitely. For sure. So please spread the word about this. And, you know, be a, be a champion. Uh, how do we overcome? Um, with the love of Jesus. That's how. We preach the truth. The word of our testimony. That's, I mean, the Bible says that point blank. You overcome the beast by the word of his testimony. The word of your testimony. Preach! Tell the truth. The blood of the Lamb. If you're saved by the Lamb, get out there and tell them. And come what may. You know? I mean, that's what we're called to do, right? We're equipping the saints for the end times. That's what Resist the Beast is all about. I know, spiritual equipping, I get it. But, um, be equipped. I'll speak. You know, my shirt today is actually from Voice of the Martyrs. This is my solidarity with my brothers and sisters in the Arabic lands. This is the uh, letter N in Arabic. That you're getting spray painted on your home if you're a Christian to tell the caliphate officers that your house is allowed to be rifled stolen goods raped your women kill anyone who they think is worthy of it 
chase you out, make you pay tax, extra taxes, submit, make you submit in any way that they say fit. So, I mean, that's the way it usually happens. That's the kind of life. Not the life in the West that a lot of us are accustomed to. Live and let live. There's no live or let live with Satan. It's bow or die. That's the example of uh, the Bible and history. All right. Uh, before I get into... Um, I'm going to talk about Joel Richardson and his uh, latest teaching, his latest appearances um, in the media, and give you an update on what's going on with him. Um, I want to put on a um, a video that shows you the. Characteristics, the attributes of the beast system, the, um, the beast government, um, and why it's it's the Islamic Caliphate and not anything else. It can't be anything else. It's in the right place, number one, where Daniel told you to look, and John and Jesus, you know, all those guys. Um, right, geography, uh, they hate Israel, of course. So don't, you know, come out of that. The the beast system is a world system of some kind, or a uh, all religions are the same, or the Illuminati or the bankers. All this is junk. All right, that's this being deceived by your own. Uh, you're outsmarting yourself. It's simpler than that. And it's not a, um, you know, Babylon is not a capitalism problem, which some people think. Uh, or, you know, a world system where, you, where it's greed and, uh, I mean, come on. God does work in the real natural world, you know. It's not all theory and spiritualization. Didn't we just go through that with the, with the millennium? The dangers of spiritualizing what is literal? So... The beast is not a system. It is an empire. An empire that rules geography, lands, countries, people. On the ground, reality. That's, that's what the beast is. It's a kingdom that comes against Jerusalem and its Messiah. And it's not from Russia. It's not from Europe. It's not from America. So these are the beast attributes. It's a really educational video. Uh, if you're listening on radio, I apologize. There's nothing but some music here. But um, I don't know. Go grab a soda. Be back.
Right, there you have it folks um, attributes of the beast and how they are fulfilled in Islam uh, I don't know how m much plainer it could be and um, realize this is a not a new video this this gentleman uh, who produced this did this four years ago I believe this is um, before the uh, Arab Spring even started or right around there so I mean you have to understand a lot of the a lot, you may this may be new to you <clears throat> this teaching or this um, pointing out of the obvious uh, the church in the Middle East this is a no-brainer they're like yeah um, talk to them I mean I've talked to these folks uh, I've talked to Palestinian Christians and Egyptian Christians and Nigerians who are under assault by Islam day after day after day. They know it's that's the Antichrist system. That's the um, the vehicle that Satan is using and will use. And this is what will fulfill prophecy. This is not a big deal for them. They realize it. Um, not all of them will can pinpoint the scriptures that demonstrate it unfortunately uh, that really hasn't come together yet but uh, it will and we'll be united as a church that will recognize this so we can effectively counter it with prayer and witnessing and um, of course self-defense when it comes to that not a problem so I mean, send me your thoughts on that, but I don't know how much plainer it could be. Joel Richardson, for example, has been saying this stuff for 10 years. And, um, and Walid Shabbat for even, for just as long or longer. And, uh, Bill Warner, um, you know, the, this is one of the, I don't want to say the good result, but what September 11th did for the West, in America specifically, is give us a fresh view. Uh, God kind of opened up the floodgates to understanding, I think. Um, you know, me personally, I mean, I can just speak for myself. God told me, or put on my heart to study Islam since 1993, so that's 22 years ago. And uh, the precipitates of that was the original World Trade Center bombing, if you'll remember. In the basement of the World Trade Center, there was a car bomb. Um, and that was our first real clear exposure to jihad and uh, why would they do this to us what the heck are we doing to you and who are they exactly what is this other religion that they have aren't we all the same that we all have the same God what is this and um, so that was the beginning of my journey it's I 
it's not that I did a great job right off the bat. It took a long, quite a while to get things uh, in order in my mind. But um, you know, for me, this was my instruction from 1993. And again, it was instructive to see how it all played out because if you remember, and you might not, you might, you might not even be old enough to remember. Uh, originally, there was nothing but denials about an attack. It was not an attack of any kind, much less an Islamic one. And um, it was an accident. It was a, a gas line, um, a fire, you know, all this bogus stuff. And that's the way it's continued. I mean, even to this day, our media will not report Christian death by the hands of Muslims because it's – I don't – I mean, there's a lot of reasons. I know the spiritual reason. But uh, it, nothing has changed. Okay, they're petrified. Um, it doesn't fit their worldview. They're in denial. All that's they're serving Satan. All those things are part of it. Um, but anyway, so there was that, and I've known since you know 1998, I guess, when the uh, the Al Qaeda first uh, reared their head as an organization when they blew up our embassies in uh, Africa, that this was a serious, serious group. And that's when I really got into researching, you know, what their aims were and goals and, and uh, their hatred of us went to our Christianity and that's it. And um, so ever since 98, 99, you know, 2000, when the coal got blown up, that was our ship in the near Yemen that I knew instantaneously what happened, but yet there were there's crazy denials everywhere at first. And then of course September eleventh. So uh I I haven't I mean I knew a lot about the religion at that point and the and the jihad movement uh, but I haven't cle- I had not clearly tied it to Bible prophecy and that's nobody's fault but mine. I take full responsibility for that. I could have been preaching this message since 1998 or sooner, but um, it just wasn't part of the plan, or I messed my destiny up in that regard, I don't know. But we're good now. And um, so anyway, point is, people have been saying this for years. It's not a new thing. People are coming to it. Students are coming to it uh, through people like Joel Richardson and Joel... Even himself, it's not a, a dogmatic, uh, narrow thing where he's not willing to learn anything new or additional details. Just like me, you know, things can change. You get informed, and the Lord teaches you. Um, so that happen is happening with him, as with all of us. <clears throat> and part of that is his most recent teaching of course you know he's written books the most famous is uh, is called islamic antichrist and actually that's that that has been out since 2009 10 maybe um it was around earlier than that you know uh, under a different title but in any event um since the mid mid 2000s joel has had the scenario laid out mapped out in writing and um so kudos to him kudos to the to the lord for the holy spirit for revealing it to us but um anyway islamic antichrist is now out in paperback so he's doing the rounds again in media uh he's was just on the jim baker show say what you will about jim baker he's proved to be a very humble and teachable person himself uh christian Uh, after going to prison uh, he, for example, he's seen the lie of pre-tribulation rapture, and he talks about it openly that he knows that post-tribulationism is correct, and um, and so he's he's had Joel on uh, just a cute day or two ago. You can find it online and my Twitter feed. You can find it there. Um, about he wide-ranging interview. Uh, with Joel about that. Anyway, he wrote Islamic Antichrist, Joel Richardson. Also, the book that I recommend more than any other prophecy book is called Mid-East Beast. You must, must read this. Um, it blows up 
many misconceptions and it lays out the scriptural solid academic case um, about the beast and the Islamic nature of it and the Mahdi and the Antichrist and all that stuff Muslim Jesus that we have to be on the lookout for and um, so anyway if you're looking for a prophecy but if all this is new to you and you need a book to read get Islamic I'm sorry get a Midi's Beast first it's my recommendation best of this generation period the end can't recommend it highly enough um, so anyway he's an author he's a teacher he's he's a missionary Joel is he goes around to many nations and has a love for the Muslim people uh, the Arabs and the uh, Persians and and just anyone who's who's in that trap he, he desperately wants to get them out bring them into the kingdom and that's just so great and awesome he's not the only one of course but just telling you what his, his bio is so <clears throat> he has a new uh, teaching out you can go again YouTube it go to my YouTube or Twitter and find it um, Daniel chapter 8 and again we've I've talked about this almost every week on my show here uh, <clears throat> since January 5th about Daniel 8 and how it's all future Daniel 7 is also future Daniel 11 is also future but I'm the more I say that the more of a minority I'm in because not many will go that far I'm not sure why other than it's this Holy Spirit thing I don't I don't know of any good reason for them to have a problem with it but people seem to um anyways we'll see what happens there daniel 8 is clearly future because it's the most easily understood of chapters in daniel i think um it it, it gives you a picture it gives you exact order of events it gives you exact events themselves it tells you it interprets who are the players there's nothing mysterious about it the only thing that trips people up is they want to make it in the past. They want to apply it to historical kingdoms when the angel who gave the vision or interpreted the vision for Daniel just comes out and says it's for the future. It's for the end time, the very end. So it's impossible that it could have happened in the past with Greece or Rome or or uh, Persia, the old Persian Empire, all that stuff. I mean, that's great to look at, but it's not what Daniel is talking about. It's a future struggle, and it's on our doorstep. That far away. Maybe that far. Very close indeed. And so I encourage you to check it out. It's an hour-long teaching on Daniel 8 when Joel was in Iraq. He just sat in his room in northern Iraq by the Kurds there and uh, just blasted out this teaching. It's, it's awesome. I completely, you know, wholeheartedly agree with it and endorse it. And, um, and again, maybe we'll get to Daniel 11 here in 7, and we'll all be on the same page, but be that as it may. So check it out. Uh, Joel is on the forefront. And basically, as far as the, the wider church is concerned, and certainly the larger culture, um, he, is, he is the man in the forefront that God has put out there now. Um, as far as detailed breakdown of the prophetic text like people like franklin graham who are very famous um are saying the right things he he's saying it um but he's not teaching from the scriptures about it and that may come i don't know but as of right now if you want to know and learn joel richardson is the guy that is visible to the church at this moment and um when things do happen he'll become even more famous uh, I, I, that means nothing to me or to him. I guarantee that. But others, like Mark Davidson, who is specifically calling for two years now for an Iranian invasion of the Middle East and a Turkish response based on those same chapters, um, he's going to be quite famous himself. And those of us who's, who are saying it beforehand, this is what God does. He uses people to um, just understand the word that he's already written and to deliver the message to the nations to their native nation and to 
the world at large. And once we do that, then he, you know, that we witnessed to it, now we can do it. So that's the where we're at. Um, again, we're, you know, not everyone will come out and say this, but I will. ISIS is the lion of Babylon. It's the first stage of the caliphate. I said before, uh, in last this time last year, I wrote on wingsoftheeagle.com that the caliphate will begin, will be reborn in the lands of Iraq and Syria. And that's exactly what happened. And I only take that, the only thing you can take away from that is God said it already. I didn't invent it. Daniel said it. So um, if the beast in Revelation 13 is the caliphate, that means all the beasts in Daniel 7 are caliphates. And the first is in Iraq and Syria. You know them as ISIS. <clears throat> and the second is the Iranians. Some... Um, it's called the Persians. Uh, they're just called Persia in different times in Daniel. Sometimes they're called the bear. Sometimes they're called the ram. It's different animals to describe their um, makeup, their personality. You know, a ram and a, and a uh, bear are very similar in that they're aggressive uh, attackers. Um. A ram will come and, and chase you and butt you with his giant horns and try to kill you. <laughs> uh, same thing with a bear. Well, not with horns, but he'll come and maul you and smash you and tear you to pieces with his teeth and his claws. And so that's the Persian Empire of today. That's the Iranians of today. You see this deception that's coming out with this nuclear uh, negotiation, it's all a ruse. If they don't have nukes already, they will get them. And by the way, who's freaking out about this? Saudi Arabia. Not Israel. Well, Israel always is on top of it, but Saudi Arabia is really flipping out. Why? Because they know that Iran will invade them. And that's in God's word, I think. Saudi Arabia will be invaded by Iran, so will Iraq, so will Turkey. And um, so that's coming. And once it does, you can say, yep, I heard it here first. Or Joel. Or Gospel of the End Times. Or Four Signposts. Several of these ministries, okay? So it's out there, and it's coming. So Saudi Arabia just, just came out yesterday or the day before that. They're signing um, agreements with Pakistan. That actually has already happened. And then the new one is South Korea, or our friend, uh, for nuclear weapons. Yeah, they're telling, they have a deal with the South Korean government and with the Pakistani government. If and when Iran goes nuclear, we don't have the time to develop a nuclear weapon ourselves, Saudi Arabia says. So we're going to buy one direct. We're going to buy nukes directly from Pakistan or from South Korea. And both those nations are like, yeah, okay. Because you know they're going to overpay. <laughs> right? They're going to way overpay once they think their um, their lives are in danger. Or the kingdom is in danger. And that's exactly what Iran is thinking. They're going to overthrow the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And they've been enemies forever. It's Again, it's a Sunni headquarters versus the Shia headquarters. And they're... Anyway... Uh, so Saudi Arabia is getting nukes from Pakistan or North uh, South Korea. So they view, view it very seriously, and you should read Isaiah 21 to know why. Not that they read Isaiah 21, but God has told you that Iran destroys Arabia and uses its nukes there, most likely. The nukes of that Iran is going after will not be used on Israel. I don't know if they're going to want to or try to, but they won't. It will not happen. There's no scriptures that say that at all. None. And if it did happen, it would be in there. <laughs> that would be a big deal. Um, so it's not in there. Arabia is attacked by Iran, and that is in the Bible. 
So watch out. Mecca, Medina, eyes up on the sky. All right. So any event, that's Joel. Uh, check out his teachings, and I'll really pray, play a real quick um, trailer here for his End Times Eyewitness DVD. Please buy this now. Show it to your church and to any church group that you have access to. It is too important not to watch. There is a sense in the world. There's a sense among believers. There's a sense among unbelievers. There's a sense among all peoples that things are unhinged. The Middle East is unhinged with uprisings, revolutions, and where is this, where is this heading? How are followers of Jesus to relate to all of these things? How do they relate to biblical prophecy? America is in spiritual, moral crisis. Values are changing, and so rapidly, I mean, that have not happened in the history of man. How are level-headed, responsible Christians to relate to the testimony of the biblical prophets and the unfolding of chaos throughout the world? Not just believers are wondering, is this a sign of the end? Welcome back to Frontline. I'm Christopher Manti, your host as always. And that was Joel Richardson's End Times Eyewitness. Please get that and distribute it ASAP. It is past time to do that. Show it in groups. Get pastors together, priests, missionary leaders. I don't care. Just show this thing. It's so important. And then, of course, you saw an ad for Armageddon News. Um... We need to wake up and get on the ball and know what's happening. That organization is um, committed to getting the daily updates. I mean, multiple dozen of updates daily on the news of the day. Uh, to the only one you can trust to get it right. So go to Armageddon News on Facebook uh, and on YouTube, of course. They make the, the greatest videos and uh, and on Twitter. So. Just follow them and stay online and stay informed and share like crazy. And a bit of breaking news here uh, coming across the <clears throat> the Israeli uh, elections, of course, are tomorrow. And uh, they are six hours ahead of Eastern time, just if you didn't know that, so set your prayer clock. Um, the, the party of Netanyahu, uh, the Likud, party looks at this point and I don't know but it looks like they're going to lose the election now it doesn't necessarily mean that he won't be prime minister again he might be even if the party loses by a little if his uh, if the seats aren't divided in a certain way where this coalition won't can't rule the government but he can put one together that will it's kind of convoluted but um, doesn't look like his party is gonna win so that's strike one. Uh, it's possible he'll remain, but if not, the new prime minister will be Yitzhak or Isaac Herzog. Uh, actually, and he's gonna—he says he's gonna share power with the, uh, a, a woman uh, in two years, and she'll take over as prime minister. Whatever. Point is, he just came out today, or just now. I saw this, 
and says that we must, this is Herzog, if he wins and he becomes prime minister tomorrow, we must divide the land. I will divide the land and Jerusalem, says Israeli opposition leader Herzog. Whoa. <laughs> if that's not the guy or the, the coalition that will divide the land for gain with the Antichrist, that's definitely the type that will. I mean, that's the government uh, mindset, the, the uh, acceptance of that position uh, certainly is the one that will sign a deal over Jerusalem. The Bible says uh, that the Antichrist will make a, uh, confirm a covenant uh, for one week. Uh, it won't, I'm sure it won't be in the treaty that it's a seven-year deal. Uh, I mean, geez, anything's possible. That would really be a, God would really think we're dumb. And which is very possible because we are. Um, but it would probably just be, you know, a treaty forever. And then it just so happens that he knows, the Antichrist knows that he's going to break it in three and a half years. Um, but <sighs> this could be the guy or the party that will sign the deal. He sounds like their mind is exactly where it will be when Israel does agree to it. And if you take that willingness to divide Jerusalem, divide the land for gain, which is a quote from the Bible, um, couple that with a fear of Iran and a nuclear Iran. And, but they're not willing to stop it, but they are scared to death of it. They're going to look out for a big brother or a a bully to keep Iran in check. And the scenario that I laid out earlier will play perfectly into that because the Bible says after Iran invades their neighbors that Turkey will lead the counterattack and destroy the government of Iran and bring everyone under the umbrella of the Turkish Caliphate or the Ottoman Empire, whatever you want to term it. Um, they'll be leading that so they will be in a position, and when the little horn comes up and assumes control of that empire, um, they will be in a position to say, hey, we don't worry about uh, Iran. We got that. They're part of us now. Uh, or if they do, you know, we'll isolate them. They will never attack you. Their, their nukes will never be used against you. We promise. A lot, you know, by peace you shall destroy. So that, they'll be like, all right, you know what? <clears throat> Fine. Um, if you can guarantee that, we believe you because you just crushed their government. Um, you've shown that you will do that. Uh, we're going to sign that on the dotted line right now. Let's take care of Iran and Jerusalem in the same swoop, in the same signature. Let's do this. They have peace in our time, the whole thing. Iran's dealt with. Peace with the Muslim world. Peace over Jerusalem. Oh man, we are set. Israel is going to say, "We, are, this is it. We got to take advantage of this. We are safe now, finally. Instead of seeing it as a giant threat, all these nations together under one leader, or ten of them with one primary, uh, they're going to see this as a comfort because they're going to say, well, no one country can lash out then. They're all under... You know, they all have an agreement themselves. So they're going to keep each other in line. I guess that's how it's going to play out. I, that would make very perfect sense to me, keeping in line with uh, God's word on that. So watch out. Basically, uh, if this guy or this party wins and he is the new prime minister, this is a very interesting development and it could be the signal that we're ready to go in Iran now, they've got a couple signals already they've got a dead Abdullah in um, Saudi Arabia which they've specifically there are prophecies uh, that say uh, an Abdullah will die and all this stuff but well, he's dead um, their current leadership their current king their current Ayatollah is on his deathbed 
They're going to have to replace him. And their, their proxy forces are all over the Middle East. They've taken uh, the fight to ISIS in Iraq. They're fighting for Assad in Syria. They're, they're heavy Hezbollah in Lebanon. It, they've taken over Yemen. So I think they're ready to rock. Um, they're just waiting for, you know, I don't know. So the next king... The next leader, once this Ayatollah dies in Iran, could well be, first of all, whoever it is, I think, is the one who's going to launch the attack, Daniel 11.2. But it could be, the, they will claim that he is the Mahdi, the Imam Mahdi, right? The 12th Imam, the one that uh, Ahmadinejad always talked about and all these dudes are waiting for. They could produce a guy and say, yep, that's him. This is him. Let's go. Things get really interesting then. <sighs> All right, so that is that is that, my friends. Uh, we have reached the, another time limit for here on Frontline. We've talked about uh, the heresy of imminence. We've talked about new teachings from Joel Richardson. We saw the Islamic beast attributes. Um, talked about Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Israel, ISIS. Uh, resisting the beast. How do you do that? What are you doing about it? And by the way, if you don't want to buy something, please help us out to spread the word and donate. You can go right to resistthebeast.org or .net and at the bottom of the page, there's a donate button. Just donate. All right? Please care prayerfully consider that if you would. And of course, Wings of the Eagle is my ministry if you want to help that specifically and get the network up and expanded. And it's always totally free. There's no cost to join the network or put your information on there. I'd be happy to do it. That's what God told me to do, so I'll do it. Uh, but if you want to donate to that also, there's a link right on that page too. Of course, all this is on Facebook. Find us and uh, talk to your fellow believers who fear the Lord. And then the Lord can prepare you, prepare us all for the soon-to-come 70th week of Daniel. And then after that great tribulation, the return of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord be with us all in this ever-darkening world. Be the light. God bless you. Broadcasting on the show if you can find it. Help each other. Be prepared for anything. Our war has just begun. <laughs>